Thank you very much, Seth. Thanks very much, everyone, for hanging around. Um, as uh, introduced, my name is James. I work for a company called Satellite Vu. Um, we are a thermal imaging Earth observation company, uh, and we plan to launch uh, the first of seven to eight satellites next year. Um, originally, when I put the abstract in, I'd only worked at the company for a few months, uh, but having been to Bucharest three years ago, and it was quite a formative experience for my career, I felt, so I just had to put in a talk here. Um, originally, I was billed for a lightning talk as well. Uh, I was moved to a general track talk. Um, so I think instead of focusing really on the, the kind of software we use, um, I thought I'd focus more on the data we've been collecting and then plugging in at the end how we are using Phosphor-G to kind of augment our product discovery. So uh, to give an overview, uh, just, well, I've already introduced myself. Uh, I'll introduce the company briefly. Um, what we're currently doing, as in we're pre-launch, uh, the first satellite will be launched next year. Um, so obviously we have to be doing something with our time in preparation. And then lastly, I'll touch on how the use of Phosphor-G has been able to augment our current operations so that we can you know, develop product ideas faster, that kind of thing. Cool, so just briefly about Satellite View, it was founded in 2016 and it's based in London. Um, as I said, it's a thermal imaging startup. We're focused on the mid-wave infrared. So for those of you who are remote sensors, we're between three and five microns, as opposed to the long wave infrared, where you know, people familiar with using Landsat, for example, would have looked at that before. Um, our satellites are going to be tasked. Uh, it's quite a narrow field of view, kind of three by four kilometers per scene. Um, but it's kind of by far the highest resolution that will be on the market and kind of available um, for use. So a 3.5 meter resolution in Nadir. And we'll be able to point off Nadir quite uh, steeply at about 35 degrees uh, at a as a compound angle. Um, so we're planning to launch a constellation of seven or eight, uh, kind of depending on future plans uh, with the first next year. We'll just show that this is kind of the atmospheric transmittance profile. So we're operating in this mid-wave infrared. It gives us information about the heat of objects. Um, cool. So obviously today we don't have any satellites, so we have to be doing something. Uh, this, the satellite, the, the sensor uh, is being... Uh, built by a company called SSTL. They're based in the south of England, Surrey Satellites. And it's actually a video camera. It can capture it up to 25 frames a second. Um, so currently we have uh, a replica. Obviously the optics are quite different uh, when you have it on the ground, uh, but the sensor is the same. Um, so we've put this camera, or SSTL has put this camera together, and we're just flying it basically as much as possible. Um, so in the first instance when I joined, I've been with the company for 15 months. We were focused on just trying to get as much data out as we can. Um, and we were flying on a, on a plane that didn't really have uh, the appropriate kind of GPS IMU, so it made georeferencing quite difficult. Um, so we decided to kind of quite quickly scale up to creating videos just to look at, see if we could see any interesting features, uh, and move towards creation of orthomosaics. Um, we actually used a commercial off-the-shelf tool called Metashape to, to generate these orthomosaics. But we have recently been experimenting with Open Drone Map. I don't know if anyone in the room is familiar with the project, but it looks, it's really nice. Like the, it's an Electron app um, that looks to kind of do everything that Metashape does. So is, uh, we're looking to move across. Uh, and the company is kind of in that product discovery phase. So we're looking for use cases. We're looking for partners to fly with. Uh, kind of for specific use cases. And uh, that's kind of uh, how we're going about business so far. Uh, so just an example of the kind of data we're capturing. Um, this is a thermal video over at Liverpool in the United Kingdom. We've flown there quite a lot just because there's a convenient airport uh, that we can launch from or take off from. Um, and we can see here, uh, in fact, the... the, the the color bar is reversed, so what's uh, bright here is actually cold, according to the sensor. But there's a lot of nuance when you're using thermal imagery um, that I'll describe in brief. Um, but definitely, if, you, if you're interested and have more questions, I'm around all week, so 
Can't wait to talk to some people about this. Okay, so that's a video, but really the video isn't that helpful. What we want to do is map this stuff. So we're in QGIS, the kind of uh, pillar of uh, Phosphor-G. And here we've uh, flown uh, a flight over the west of London. It's in a borough called Ealing. And uh, what I'm doing here is just zooming into features that we can see. So really, um, I'll let the GIF start again because there's a couple of nuances uh, with thermal data that I was uh, kind of alluding to. Um, which uh, kind of make it trickier to use than maybe optical data. Um, so first, when we see the initial zoom, we'll zoom into a building that has a metal roof. And in thermal imagery, it appears, well, in un uncorrected thermal imagery, it appears very dark. Uh, and the reason this is is because the, the metal actually emits radiation at a slower rate than other materials. We then pan over to what well, is almost definitely a fire, uh, and I'm just uh, querying the pixel values here. So this is 269 Kelvin versus the 260 Kelvin next door. So for some reason, there's something that nine, that's nine degrees hotter. It's, it's in fact likely a lot hotter, but the, the sensor is saturated. Um, so these are the kind of things that we see across the imagery. And if you stick with me, I'll show you how to get access to some of our imagery too, so you can see for yourself. Okay, so we're kind of uh, have all this flight data collected and we're trying to do our best to go out to the market and see who might be interested in using this. Uh, here's a kind of a monitoring, an industrial monitoring dashboard we're calling it. We developed this using Dash and Dash Leaflet, which is open source uh, kind of dashboarding tools. Um, here we're kind of, we've drawn polygons around areas uh, at a, um, an oil refinery and we're kind of graphing what we see as the, the activity, um, which is basically just the excess temperature generated versus the background temperature for that particular area. We think there's a whole raft of use cases associated with this kind of uh, monitoring. Um, for those of you who are at Patricia's keynote, um, she, she spoke about kind of vulnerability in kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, you know socio-economically deprived communities. Um, we think our resolution will be high enough that we can at least at a district level say where, you know, we need to install insulation in this row of buildings. And it's the kind of information that for a country like the UK, which is quite an old housing stock, there's desperate need for retrofitting. And it's kind of a similar situation to the kind of static caravans that Patricia was alluding to, where really we just need evidence to make people act. Um, so we see that uh, we have Landsat on the left here, which is a kind of 100 re meter resolution, and the 3.5 meters just gives us a bit more detail on where the urban heat island is coming from, and kind of what, for example, what buildings and what impact could retrofitting a building have on that heat island effect. Because, I mean, it's basically unbelievably tragic that anyone should die in their own home, goes without saying. Okay. We also were flying in Berlin at the time where there was a, a large forest fire to the west of the city, Grunwald, for those of you who are aware. Um, and we decided to fly over it just to see um, what it looked like um, because we were doing some mapping for uh, a partner. Uh, and we can see here that uh, the fire front is kind of quite visible, but also quite interestingly, the kind of, there's a, a portion within the center of the fire which is cooler than the fire front. So, uh, you know, we don't see fire mapping as one of our core products because uh, there are other companies I think coming to market who will cover that uh, kind of niche a bit in a bit more detail or be able to have wider mapping. But um, after seeing this, we think there is potentially some use case there. Okay, so kind of describe some of the use cases of what we're seeing. Uh, and we have this kind of image processing pipeline um, that we've kind of split up into stages. And for georeferencing, we're just using QGIS for the time being. We're georeferencing the ortho mosaics, and then we're kind of digging in to see what kind of uh, features that we can see. Um, so as I was describing before, uh, one of the nuances with thermal data is that the material actually really matters um, when you're uh, trying to estimate the land surface temperature. So we, 
There's a step um, of calibration where we take calibration files from our camera and then convert it into a metric called brightness temperature. Um, it's in degrees Kelvin, so it's a bit familiar. So you can say, if there's two identical things beside one another, you can tell the temperature difference between those two things, as long as they're made of the same material. Um, for the next step, we need to correct for the materials within an image. Um, so, you know, the way we're doing this, the way we're going about doing this in the first instance is to use open data. Um, and really, without it, we'd be quite stuck. And then, uh, as with any um, space-borne observation, we have to correct for the atmosphere. And there's quite a lot of it to contend with, uh, with thermal imagery. Um, but once we do that, we'll be able to tell temperature through time for a given area. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of complexities here. Um, and I also should note that our satellite will be in inclined orbit. So it'll be uh, imaging at both day and night. Uh, nighttime is by far the preferable condition. Uh, but we think there's some use cases for daytime imagery as well. OK, so we're trying to define our product levels. And there's quite a lot of other companies coming uh, in, in the kind of new space sphere who are doing similar things. And we're all used to seeing things like L1C or L2A, uh, people who've used maybe Sentinel or Landsat in the past. Um, but really what we're trying to do, um, and we see other new space companies doing, is try to describe our product levels as what they are. So if you can imagine we're in a computing environment and we want to kind of name the product levels as some sort of sensible variable name, uh, it becomes obvious that we should name it M, M2, and M3. I'm just kidding. Basic, relative, and absolute, so that we can kind of track uh, what we're looking at a bit closer. OK, so moving on from the, the data itself to the software that we're using, I mean, the reason I didn't really want to go into too much detail on the software, is that it's a bit boring, you know? It's, it's, uh, it's really the, the hardened software that's used across the PhosphorG community. We use PostGIS, we use FastAPI, and there's a project called Stack Fast API. For those of you who are familiar with Stack, it's a, a metadata store for um, Earth observations. We're very big fans of ODC Stack, which is the Open Data Cube extension to X-Ray. And I'm just showing kind of a little snippet from a Jupyter Notebook uh, on kind of some of the functionality it offers, like we can do reprojection and resampling quite easily uh, and pull it out as an X-Ray once we've retrieved our stack query. And then um, we're using Svelte on the front end to, do, uh, to build our front end applications uh, using Slippy Maps. Um, so one of the, the benefits of using something like ODC stack is that we can pull data from our stack. Uh, so this is satellite view data. You can pull data from the Sentinel-2 stack, uh, kindly hosted by Element84 on AWS, and have the exact same bounding box resolution projection. So we can compare like for like. So quite handy. Um, oops. OK. So. Obviously, I don't have a tool to present and I haven't really, you know, this, it, this is a software conference after all, and it's an open source software conference. Very aware of that. Um, so I think we're currently quite a small team, but we're taking on more developers. We're in a position now that we can start contributing to the community. Um, so kind of some hopes for this week and me being here is to kind of speak with other companies and the, stack, the core stack developers to uh, start, uh, first of all, design a tasking specification so that if you order data from Capella or Planet, Black Sky and us, you can use the same queries because really you should be able to, um, with some caveats, uh, obviously for SAR and that kind of thing. Uh, one thing that we're seeing a growing need for is kind of access to stacks based on user personas. Or like, uh, I think in an ideal world, all of the data would be open, but the reality is uh, a lot of companies are commercial companies. And um, so I think we're looking at uh, kind of contributing to a middleware which we can kind of restrict access to certain um, items in a stack based on who's calling. There's also legal obligations here for a company like ours. And then lastly, we're kind of looking at uh, a thermal extension for stack because there's, as, as described, there's some unique elements to working with thermal data. And so, I think there's 
that's a little loose at the minute, but I think it's, a, it's an emerging thing that we'll probably need in the near future. Okay, so I promised that I'd show you some stuff that you can access. We actually have a, a public static stack. Um, if you go to stack.satelifeview.com, you'll be able to access a few of the more interesting images uh, that we've collected over Liverpool. Um, so it's just five images, um, but you know, we, uh, we feel like these are kind of quite representative of some of the use cases that I spoke about earlier. Uh, and all I've done here is load it into Jupyter Notebook environment. I'm using PyStack to draw the images. So for example, here's a power plant. We can see uh, an outflow stream um, as it's using it for coolant and then pumping it back into the canal. We can see some effects of the, the solar angle because this is taken at kind of towards the end of the day. We can see certain uh, roof directions are hotter than others. Uh, a port in, or sorry, a ship in a, in a dock, that kind of thing. So go have a look and come chat with me if you need any more help on kind of how to use that. Um, we also, as part of a team building exercise towards the start of this year, participated in a hackathon, uh, and that's on our public GitHub page. Um, it kind of just uses very standard, to, well, standard for the Earth observation field tools to develop a model to try and do a fire prediction um, based on views data um, in North America. Um, so just to wrap up, uh, I think one of the reasons I didn't talk about the architecture is, uh, you know, to to lean on Paul's tweet here, start with boring, simple architecture and scale in a boring, simple way. I think that's exactly what we're doing. You know, we're not, we don't need flashy stuff. Um, so we're just using the tried and tested geospatial tools, phosphor G tools, um, to build out uh, our applications at the minute. I think also I'm gonna note that this is quite specific to thermal, but there's quite a few thermal companies that are up and coming. You might know some names like Hydrosat, Aurora, um, and Constell IOR. And we're kind of all lumped in together, but really we're not at the stage where we can actually compete. So we should definitely be collaborating, at least in my eyes. And this is Scott from Hydrosat kind of agreeing. So I agree with him there that there's uh, definitely a lot of collaboration needs doing um, between these commercial organizations and doing it in the open is the best in my eyes. And then, you know, go forth and do good in the world. I think <laughs> this is the words to live by um, because uh, obviously <laughs> we need to uh, remind people who are doing evil to install Rastereo like this. But yeah, that's all I have to say for now. Thank you very much for listening.